Hello, I'm Adrian Quiney, and I keep bees in Hudson, Wisconsin, and I have been uh, raising queens deliberately and accidentally since 2008. And many beekeeping courses talk about buying and introducing queens. As I moved along my path towards sustainable local beekeeping, I concluded that raising my own queens was a smart move because sustainability and affordability go together. The traditional beekeeping model emphasizes buying those mated out-of-state queens in mid-May, when locally mated queens are unavailable due to our climate. This timing compels us to be consumers, which I believe is unfortunate and a big mistake. I'm convinced that there is a better way. So this short presentation is about two easy methods I'm familiar with. I will start with the simplest deliberate method, I know, and then move to another simpler accidental incidental method. Well, let's start with the, with the when before we move to the why and the how. Raising queens in Wisconsin is like gardening in Wisconsin, in that gambling with our weather is futile. Don't do it. The very, very earliest I will start to try to raise queens is the latter part in May. It is much better to wait until June, when we are not likely to suffer days of frost and cold northern winds. In June, drones are abundant. I don't raise drones to mate with my own queens. I rely on yours to do the job. Drones in sufficient numbers to mate with virgin queens are flying by June. On sunny days, when the temperatures are in the 70s, drones meet up at places called drone congregation areas, also known as DCAs. They make multiple trips to these DCAs and fly around and wait for a virgin queen to arrive. In June, queens will find drones to mate with, but they might not in May. Also at this time of year, there is natural pollen and nectar available, and one doesn't need to have to feed the new split colonies that are a product of queen rearing. And at this time of year, it's natural for the bees to want to draw out combs on the new frames you're going to need. Now, which colony to choose from? Well, preferably one that's overwintered, one you like, gentle and productive, one that has a marked queen or a queen you can find and mark, and it's grown to fill two deep 10 frame boxes, and it looks like it might swarm if you don't split it. Mike Palmer, a beekeeper from Vermont who influences me, says start with the bees you have. Even if you have only one overwintered colony, use that one unless it's an angry one, because temperament tends to be hereditary. There is variability amongst the anonymous drones, and if some of those drones are also from angry hives, it might not be much be fun later on to work with those bees. I like to mark my queens as soon as I find them at colony inspections in the spring to make them easier to spot before the colony gets too big to find them. And queens have different body colours, so if you have a yellow queen, you might not need to mark her because she, she stands out pretty well. But if she's darker, it can be really tricky to find her. And the colony you are going to split should be grown into two 10 frame deeps and be so congested with bees that it looks like it might swarm. If you're worried that it may swarm before you get to it, then just put a, a super or two above an excluder just to get, take off the pressure. You can always take them off when you come to start the process. So starting the process, Mel Disselkin's method of queen rearing is the first deliberate method that I used. This is Mel's book. Feel free to take a screenshot or a photo of the book and order it if you want to. I will give a reference at the end. Now, Mel's method is just two steps and two visits. Visit one, you take away the queen and notch the cells. And then visit two, seven days later, you divide the colony into splits or nukes, leaving no more than queen cells per colony. Reduce the entrances and leave them alone for three weeks. Now, the cover page from Mel's, the front of Mel's book shows the notching process. At the first visit, after you remove the queen, you take your hive tool or a pointy knife and break down the cell wall between, beneath the smallest la worker larva you can see, at least two or three larvae on four to six frames in the brood nest. 
This is when you learn that you need better eyes or better glasses. In a colony with a decent laying queen, when you look amongst the larva, the patch of larva, they'll be, they'll be graduated in size from largest to smallest to eggs. And so you pick the larva that you can barely see that are right next to the eggs, and those will be the youngest and the right size. And what does the actual notching achieve? Well, it allows the workers better access to feed that cell. And removing the lower cell wall allows the bees to build the cell downwards, vertically. If your frames are older and have generations of thick black cocoons, then the bees have to build the queen cell out before they go down. And then when you come to move the frames around, those cells are more likely to be damaged and bumped against the next frame as you move things around. Now in the illustration, you see that Mel is notching the cell in the lower part of the frame, but not at the very bottom. Cells at the very bottom of the frame are easily damaged, and if they protrude, if they protrude below the frame. So to summarize, at visit one, you have converted a strong queen right hive into a strong queenless hive. The bees are obligated to make new queens. And this makes for very well-fed queens, and very well-fed queens make the best queens. Now, this is what it looked like in an apiary when I've, when I've done it. I divide the double deep colony among five frame nukes. You don't, you don't have to. Mel puts them in 10 frame boxes, but I find that to be uh, a problem because you don't have enough bees to look after the whole box. I prefer the smaller boxes. Each grouping of nukes is spaced around the site of the original double deep 10 frame parent colony that was split. They face the center. Now note that I've tried to make each box look a little different so the returning mated queen finds the right box. The box is a little, a little different from each other on the outside, but when I make them up, I make them as identical as possible on the inside. And when I talk about frame numbers, I'm referring to a five frame box in positions one to five. The first thing I do is select the frames that have queen cells on them. I'm very gentle with these frames. I reduce the cells to a maximum of two queen cells. They look like peanuts, and I put them in the frame position three in each box. I like to leave well-developed cells that are not on the bottom of the frames where they're going to be damaged or could chill. If I had no choice, I would use those, but I'd shim the box up so that they wouldn't get bumped on the bottom. There can be as many as 30 or 40 cells in that colony when you come back, and the bees might not have selected the cells that you tried to initiate with the hive tool. And this has happened to me, and don't worry about it. Just pick the best-looking cells you see. And by best, that usually means the biggest. And as we're not bees, we don't really know what the best looking cell is. It's just the best looking cell to us. And after you've distributed the, the cell frames, then you go around to distributing the rest of the frames. And it's like dealing with cards. Each, fr each box gets frames of brood in positions two and four and, and frames of honey in positions one and five until all the frames are gone. And the colonies don't ever need to be fed at this time. I place a bit of wood or tile or cardboard on, under the front of the box to stop the grass from obscuring the entrances. And the entrances are reduced to the smallest entrance, which is just a few bee widths wide. Then do not disturb. If you disturb the colony, for reasons we don't understand, they, dis they take it out and they kill the virgin queen, which is a suicide move. It makes no sense, but beats me. That's what they do. In three weeks time, there is an 80% chance that they'll be queen right. If they are, good. But don't let them go more than four weeks queenless or they will turn into laying workers. An easy way to test if they are queen right, if you are not sure, is to put a frame of brood in there and wait a few days. If they were queenless, they would make queen cells from that brood. From this point, you manage the colony as you see fit. And that ends the, the simplest deliberate method I know. So I'll move on to the simplest accidental method. Doesn't get much simpler than this. Divide a colony about to swarm into as many boxes as you have swarm cells. Leave the queen or the weakest split with a queen cell on the original site where the original entrance is. So imagine this, you just come to your colony, 
It's late May and early July, it's making queen cells, and conventional, traditional beekeeping suggests you break down those cells, or you do a reversal, or you take a split for a purchased queen, and or you add supers, or any combination of those things, but that destroys some great cells. An alternative is just to make splits, using those queen cells before the colony swarms. Even if you can't find the queen, just divide it up, as I did in the previous method, and let the bees sort it out. Then leave them alone for three weeks, or maybe four weeks if the cells were not completely sealed. That's all there is to it. Now, the conclusion is making queens at the right time of the year adds interest to your beekeeping journey and is a lot of fun. And then, of course, I'm ready for questions, and there's some really good resources. Well, I'm saying really good. That's kind of a blowing my own trumpet for the, my own YouTube channel, but that's it. All right. Well, hello. Well, if you're going to raise a few queens for yourself, then uh, you're going to need a little, equ little equipment for that. And it doesn't have to be elaborate. When I first um, started, I tried with the 10 frame box, but to be honest, uh, having a whole 10 frames dedicated to one queen is very resource intense. So I moved away from that and then the large part of my time I've been using five, five frame boxes, just a basic five frame bottom board, a box, an entrance reducer, a wine cork to reduce it, and then you can get you can spend a lot of money if you look at the catalogues on inner covers and outer covers for these boxes. It's not necessary. This is a chicken feed bag. I've used um, plastic greenhouse material, and I put that on as the inner cover and peel that off. And then on top of that, I put a piece of insulation. I put the insulation on and an obligatory rock to stop the thing blowing away. Otherwise, you can spend, if you buy the fancy inner cover, the outer cover, you're into 20 bucks. And what have you got? Nothing but a lid. So this is really just a couple of dollars. Now, going a bit further and having fun raising queens, because raising queens is a whole lot of fun, then you might want to raise more. And then even five frames seems a little bit too much. So what I did was, being cheap, I adapted the bottom board and put a little divide in the center. And then I put a divide in the top, and now I've got down to two frames on each side. But that, that, um, that works, but it's not ideal, because the trouble, the trouble is you can't get a lot of either food or bees in there, and as soon as the bees start to eat that, then you can run into, into difficulties. They could be poor nutritionally, so that's, no, that's not as good. And also, if you've got a hand, and you want to get the, or you want to find the queen, and she happens to be on the, on the side. You can't, you can't really get her out. So I've not been that happy with that. But the thing I'm, I'm happy, happy with uh, is the three by, the three by three. So this is a, a canvas in a cover, a ten frame box, and three compartments. In each of these compartments, I can actually reach my hand in to gra grab a queen if she's actually on the side. There's three frames, so that allows you a little more time to get the queens mated and laid up and check they're doing okay and a little more feed. And how you, what you do around that is, or what I found useful is, you put the, you have the box on here, and each returning mating queen comes to a different side. And when they're done and they're mated, if you don't want to move them anywhere else in the apiary, then you can actually take three five frame boxes and transfer the frames into the five frame box and have one entrance facing that way, one entrance facing that way, and one entrance facing that way with a third box. Then that way you don't lose any foragers. And I found that to be quite satisfactory. So, and the basics are, you can get as elaborate and as fancy as you want, but I found the three frames to be the optimal, but just starting off, I really recommend you get a basic five frame, five frame box or two. You'll never be uh, unhappy that you've got more equipment than you need, but you'll be very unhappy if you don't have enough.